Hi friends, welcome to another episode of Osmosis. We've now experienced a whole host of business leaders and characters that we've interviewed here. We've had former F&B uh, CEO Michael Jordan, we had the CEO of uh, Retail Capital, Carl Westwich, we had the doyen of Black Business in South Africa, Dr. Richard Mabonya, and a series of others. Today's conversation I'm really excited by. One, because I'm joined by a dear friend, and two, because it's a conversation that is not often linked to what we talk about in our lives as entrepreneurs, but it's really important. Today we talk about wealth. What is it, how do you accumulate it, and how do you manage it? And to help me with this conversation is a dear friend, Mike Fannin. Obviously, thanks How's for having me. Yeah, I must admit, with the names you've just mentioned there, it's quite intimidating. You've had some pretty serious people in this chair. Yeah, every, every, everybody's just having a conversation. I think, you know, I think that the, the point about what we do is it's, um, so, you ever heard the expression, knowledge is power? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's rubbish. <laughs> Application of knowledge is power. I like that. Right? So, what we try to do with this platform is to not only give people the, the information, but also to try and inspire them to go, now go use it. Go do something with it, right? Fantastic. Um, and your, your story is interesting because, you know, every time I talk to you, I feel like we could come at this from so many angles. So, I could talk to you as the expert who does what you do, but also I could talk to you as the entrepreneur who is in a business and as part of a team that's building a business that wants to be the largest dist distributor of high net worth products in the continent, right? Yeah, yeah. First, talk to me a bit about your entrepreneurial journey. How's that gone? Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a, how far back do we go? Um, from, the, from when I was at university, I've always wanted to look at doing something that was different. Yeah. I never wanted to be just the guy who ran out and you know, got the job in a bank and went from there and yeah. you know, just those steps. So I lasted my entire career as an employee was 14 months in investment banks in London. I literally went there. 14 months later, I decided I didn't want to jockey spreadsheets for a living. And what I wanted to do was do something different. Mm. And I think that's the first thing you've got to do is you've got to find something you're passionate about. And my passion has always been helping people with their finances. Mm. And since then, I've had a variety of businesses, some of which have been spectacularly successful, some of which have been su successful to a point in terms of my own needs being reached, but some which weren't successful at all. Sure. Okay. But it's the important thing is that it was a journey of growth, and each time I learned something from each and every single one Got of you. them. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, you know, even when I was at Varsity, I had small businesses. I had a nightclub, I had a clothing business. Um, some were pretty exciting, some were exciting for the wrong reasons, but <laughs> each one you learn a little bit, a couple of different things from them. You know, right. So, yeah, in terms of where we are right now is Carrick. Carrick is the culmination of a whole lot of partners of all of our journeys, of all of the things we learned in our various careers coming up to now. And we've kind of put it all together to build something where we're trying to make an optimal offering in terms of a financial services offering that really meets the needs of what people are looking for. Gotcha. You know, we spoke a little bit earlier about the fact that there's a lot of things out there selling product. We, we don't want to be in the business of selling products. Yeah. You know? We actually want to be giving advice, yeah. sitting down with people, really understanding what it is they're looking for, and then going out and finding it. Yeah. You know, I might not have it on the shelf, but I might know where to go and look for it. Got you. So you do a, a lot of, it, to, your, to the point, a lot of advisory work, particularly to people who are either high net worth or looking to become high net worth. Yeah, most definitely. Talk to me a bit about if, when you're an entrepreneur, what are the three most important things you should have top of mind when you're thinking about how to begin to the process of accumulating wealth? Okay, wow. Um, that's a broad topic. I think the first thing as an entrepreneur is you've got to realize is this is going to take some time. Right. You know, there's a, there's a speech that Jack Ma from Alibaba gave a couple of weeks ago where he said, you know, if you're planning on getting out in three years, That's it's it. going to take you five. Yeah. If you're planning on five, it's going to take you ten. Yeah. There is no fast route out of this. Yeah. A lot of people see entrepreneurs as these guys who are wildly successful. You know, they've got money, they've got cars, they've got all these things. But they don't see behind is the pain and the long road it took them to get there. Yeah. So the first thing as an entrepreneur that you've got to realize, it's going to take you some time. Right. Find something that you're passionate about. Okay, That's your first take. I think the first steps before you get into the nitty gritty, it's the three Ps. Passion, people, and persistence. Right. Passion, you've got to have something that you are truly, truly passionate. You want to do this because there's going to be a number of days where you get out of bed and you think, oh, I just can't go in today. Mm. You know, your business isn't going, growing as fast as it could. You've got cash flow problems. You've got all these things against you. And without that passion for doing it, you're not going to be able to go pull through. Mm. Mm. The second thing you want to be really looking for as an entrepreneur to start creating what you need people. Mm. You know, it's what people are you getting around yourself, who you're working with. And, uh, th you know, there's a saying of, you know, get the right people on the bus and then decide what you're going to do. It's not necessarily about the product. If you're surrounded with the right people, people yeah, yeah. who are committed to that passion I spoke yeah. about earlier, yeah. and they're completely, you're all single-minded about hitting it, yeah. then you're going to find somewhere you're going to make up. You're going to get towards your goals. Yeah. You know, you can have the best people in the world, okay? But if you're not unified in terms of a passion, you're not going to get there. So, yeah. so get the right people, and even try them in different roles. Mm. 
You know, here's the other thing. You may have a guy, we, you know, I look at myself in, in Carrick. I think I'm on my fifth different role within the company that's only three years old. <laughs> Because there's been things that I've been good at and needed at the time, but we've also been flexible enough to move me and use my skills where they're most, where they're most needed. Right, right. The last thing that an entrepreneur is going to need is persistence. Right. Okay, persistence goes beyond anything. You know, somebody said to me, I imagine it's like giving blood. Yeah. And they say, how much blood are you going to give? And they say, everything I've got. And I say, it's not enough because you're probably going to have to borrow some as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and, and that's the part, you know, when you're going through hell, keep going. And, and really, you know, there's, there's, there's no entrepreneur in the world that has had, a, had, a, had an easy ride where it's been plain sailing all the way through. Each and every person who started a business has stared that wall in the face and said, you know, what, what have I done? 100%. You know, and it's 100%. that persistence to say, I was passionate about this. I've got the right people with me and to keep on driving, driving through. And those are those characteristics you absolutely have to need, gonna add, sorry, are actually absolutely going to have to have. Love it. Absolutely love it. So passion, persistence, people. Yeah. When we come back, we continue our conversation with uh, Mike. Welcome back. We continue our conversation with Mike Fannin, uh, direct and partner at Carrick Wealth. We're talking about the sort of the intersection between entrepreneurship and wealth creation. How you and I need to look at our own blind spots and how we need to take care to ensure that we don't stand in our own way. So, Mike, welcome back. A quick question for you. Over the years where you've worked with high net worth individuals, what have you learned about their relationship with money? Um, two words, they stay humble. Live, wow. live below your means. You know, one of the, one of the things that's sort of, a, it's, it's, it's a common theme over and over again is people who've managed to acquire wealth as opposed to income, mm. okay, live within their means. Mm. Okay, you don't see them out buying the big cars, they're playing the long game. You know, I, I spoke to you earlier about an entrepreneur that I know, he's not interested in, in the million, mm. he's going for the billion. Mm. He's keeping his money tight, he's slowly but surely reinvesting in his business, you know, live within your means. And that, it's a massive common theme. The second thing that they do is they educate themselves. Mm. They educate themselves and it's an ongoing process. They never stop learning. Okay, 90% of people with wealth read every single day. Mm. But the interesting thing is they don't read fiction. You know, not in the latest James Patterson. Mm. They're reading biographies. They're mm. reading market news. Mm. They're educating and upskilling themselves on an ongoing basis. Mm. Mm. And I think it's important, you know, is that especially when you move into an entrepreneurial field, if you do come across something that you've come up with a great idea and, it's, and, and it takes, there are going to be 10 guys who are going to hook onto your, onto your coat heels and they're going to start trying to compete with you. Of course. So that development that those people who have wealth keep doing, it's got to keep you ahead of the game. Right. You've got to keep reinvesting your money back into growing the business. Got to keep reinvesting in yourself to growing your own intellect. We often say in the firm, in our firm, uh, imitation, innovation encourages imitation. Hundred percent. Anytime you innovate, when it kicks, people imitate you. It's just, and and for me, it's funny. It's like ninety nine percent of people out there have no innovative bone in their body. They just sit and wait for somebody to do something new. Yeah. And yeah. then they're going to copy what the other person has done, right? And you know what? Don't get angry about it. It's flattery. You've come up with an amazing concept. And the fact is, is that if you're actually good at what you do and you've researched it properly, you can evolve, yeah. you're going to evolve and you're yeah. going to go ahead. Yeah. You know, it's one of the things that I say to people, and this is the, the biggest part, is that if you've done it properly, you know, right up front, we spoke about getting those right people there in a room. Yeah. Okay. And we've got that passion. Now, the next thing we've got to do is we've got to have that goal. Yeah. And something else that people do is write that goal down. You know, writing goals down is an, un, it's a, it's, it's an unusual habit to develop. But 70 to 80% of highly successful people write their goals down yeah. because you're actually committing to it. Yeah. Now, in writing that goal down in, 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 in an entrepreneurial space, that's called a business plan. <laughs> okay? And you'd be surprised how many people I meet who start businesses and are in their second, third, or fourth year and still haven't written one. But that business plan not only gives you a track of what to do in terms of growing it, it'll also tell you what happens when you've got opportunities, when you've got threats. Yeah. What is your plan for when competitors come in? Yeah. So you're never caught... At a moment, you know, struggling for words, struggling to find a position, mm. you're ready for it. Mm. You've planned for this. Mm. You've planned to innovate. You've planned where your investment's going to go. Mm. Not only am I going to take my profit and reinvest in my company, but this is where I'm going to reinvest mm. it. That's what my plan says. Mm. Mm. You don't get diverted. You've got a singularity of focus. Mm. You know, there's the, the age old, the adage of the too many buffaloes. Mm. You know, when a lion hunts, it goes for that one buffalo and hits it and takes, no matter how many run in front of it, it just goes, goes for, for one. that one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. your business plan shows you that one. So that's where my investment's going to go. That's how I'm going to grow my business. It's true too, isn't it, about just life generally, is how you've got to have a, a singularity to the point, yep. a single view of where you want things to go. Yeah. So, so I'm an entrepreneur. I'm doing fairly okay. My business does okay. I can meet my month-end uh, expenses. And I have a little bit left over. Yeah. What questions should I be asking myself to start in my mind the conversation about really creating and then preserving wealth? 
I think the big thing is also is to diversify. You know, the, the, uh, a friend of mine has a saying, it's not only should you not have all your eggs in one basket, you shouldn't have only one goose laying the eggs. And wow. I, I think it's important that the second you start to free up that extra capital is to diversify into assets or that are going to grow equity or grow wealth that are not directly correspondent to what you're currently involved in. If you're a tech business, don't go invest in a whole lot more technology companies. 100%. Let's try and spread it around because every bubble bursts at some stage. Everything mm. has their cycle. Mm. So what you want to do is start growing assets and it must be in real assets. Mm. Okay? You know, if you're a startup, don't go invest in a whole lot of other startups. Mm. You've already got your risk capital. Okay, so start to differentiate in terms of asset classes, in terms of geographical diversification. Um, you know, it could be different currencies or whatever it may be, but make sure you're diversifying as you grow. But the biggest thing is, just to roll back, is your time of what to invest and when is determined by that business plan again. Because mm. within that, you've got to be saying, this is the point when we will take money out. Mm. Not, okay, we've got a couple of hundred thousand rand left over, what do we do with it? Okay, mm. let's pay it out. Mm. You've already made a bad, that your, your system should tell you when to reinvest, mm. when to pay it out. At mm. what point that's now capital for the shareholders, mm. what point it's back for the business. Mm. And you have to stick to those rules. One of the challenges about living in South Africa is it's incredible. And to make it a local conversation now is this, in my view, is one of the hardest countries in the world to create and preserve wealth. Purely because, and this is just my view, yeah. there, there, are so many, there are so many systems, processes and laws to part you with your money that it's really hard to go, to go yeah, you know, I, I'm willing to wake an eight, work an 18 hour day for 10 years on end. Yeah. Because at the end of it, the trajectory of my, what my, my net worth looks like is different to the guy who just gets an eight to five job, yeah? So, so here's the question I'm asking. Yeah. So here's the question. One, is my assertion right, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I suppose the question specifically I'm asking leads to the second question, which is what is the benefit of looking at going offshore yeah. in terms of getting exposure to different markets so that yeah. you can diversify your risk? Yeah. Okay, so first one, yeah, unfortunately I do disagree. You want a place that's hard to grow money? Yeah. Go to Australia. They've got a million ways to take cash off you. Wow. Go come across the U.S. Re Internal Revenue Service. Yeah. The taxation there makes us, we're amateurs. Yeah. Okay, we're a country that is still growing and has the opportunity to grow at a rate of knots. We've got a couple of issues we've got to sort out, but a lot of it's virgin markets. Mm. A lot of things that are mature in other countries are brand new here. We haven't even started them yet. Mm. So there's a lot of ideas, you know, we spoke about people who are just sitting there waiting to take an idea. That only, you don't actually need your own idea. There's 50 ideas that have worked well in other countries that haven't even started here yet. How about you? That you could look at potentially. Is there a regulation? Regulation's a good thing. We run towards regulation because regulation keeps the cowboys off. The guys who are going to follow you, <laughs> it gets rid of them. If you're running a compliant, a legally, a legally compliant business within the law, okay, and you're doing it properly, yeah, it'll take a little bit longer to get up there, but that regulation actually protects you from the day trip who's going to try and take your money off you. I understand. The second question in terms of going offshore, Offshore is, a, is an investment question. You know, I've always likened it to, I think I've heard you, you've heard me use the analogy before. If you imagine a, a field, a cricket field of 100 square meters, yeah. and you've got, you, you, you got your children, you're going to take them out, you're going to go play cricket, yeah. and what you do is you stand in a one square meter space on that field, this tiny little block, and that's the only place you play, and all that other grass sits out there. Yeah. And, and that other grass is offshore. Okay? South Africa is 1% of the global financial market. If we only invest here and only play here, we're back to are only one goose. 100%, yeah. it's, it's a standard practice in terms of investment to diversify by geography, by asset, by asset class, by currency. This is normal. This isn't, it's not hiding money. It's not doing anything. Normal. It's a normal part of investing. Mm. And it's extremely prudent, especially when we live in a country which is extremely volatile. Mm. Our rand, you could wake up tomorrow and you could be worth 30% less. <laughs> you know, when you see these exchange rates go up and down, I always say people say, what does that mean? And I say, well, if you imagine, you know, when I go to Woolworths, okay, I do all my shopping and I, do, and I put my meat in last. Mm. That's the last one I go and I get my meat. And what, what, what a 30% drop in exchange rate means, somebody comes along to my trolley and takes all my meat out and says, you can't have that anymore because your rand's not only going to buy what's left. Wow. And that's what those movements in exchange rate can do to you. So you want to be investing your retirement wealth in hard currencies that offer a lot more stability. I got you. So finally, to close it, um, to the entrepreneur watching this conversation, who is, again, at the point in their lives where they're having to make decisions about what does their future look like, to make sure that I understood it. So you said passion, people, persistence, got yep. that. You said look to diversify, got that. Yep. You said make sure that you act for your circumstance and your situation, got that too. What is top of mind that you'd like that entrepreneur to always have consistently at the back of his mind about creating a legacy, particularly a financial legacy? 
remember what you got into it for in the first place. Okay, yeah. this whole thing's supposed to be fun. Yeah. Okay, we all get into this for a reason. That passion that we spoke about, remember why you did it in the first place. There yeah. would have been a moment you woke up and thought, mm -hmm. this is what I want to do. Okay, you were a speaker. Yeah. There was a moment you woke up and thought, oh, I want to talk. Yeah. And it, we sometimes get disconnected from that with all the stuff that gets in the middle. We forget why we started. Gotcha. Don't forget why you started. Because that's your core. It'll, when you, if you keep coming back to that, it'll be your base that you build through in unstable times. And it'll fuel you when you go Completely, fuel, yeah. completely. So, you know, that to me is the, is the, is the big one. If there's, no, there's no magic bullet to this thing. There's no right way. There's guys who went into Dragon's Den and got told to get rid of, you know, to run away and they all made, money. made money. And some yeah, of that, yeah. There's so many different stories. So there's no right to run. But the big things are connect your, there's a, there's a great book, Jim Collins, Good to Great. Right. Hedgehog Principle says, find something that you love Find something that you can be the best in the world at, mm. and then make sure that it makes you money. Mm. <laughs> and that, my friends, is where we good where we leave it. Find something that you love, find something you're the best in the world at, and make sure that it makes you money. This is uh, Vusi Tebogao, who's presented another episode of Osmosis, joined by my good friend Mike Vannon from Carrick Wealth. Cheers.